Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the MyGBC podcast. Today, we are delving into a topic of immense historical and contemporary importance being treaties in Canada. Our special guest for the episode is Maurice Switzer, a renowned Indigenous rights advocate, author, and expert in the field of treaties. Through his extensive experience and knowledge, uh, Mr. Switzer has dedicated his life to shedding light on the intricacies and significance of treaties that have shaped Canada's history and continue to impact its present. We are honored to have him join us today as we begin our journey of discovery, uncovering the stories, insights, and perspectives of treaties in the Canadian context. So without further ado, let's dive into the heart of the matter and learn from Mr. Switzer about his passion for treaties and their far-reaching implications. So hi, Mr. Bruce, how are you doing today? Oh, well, hi, Bunta. And if I can, before we start, I'm just going to, I always like to say a few words in Anishinaabemowin in, in um, a language. I'm certainly not a fluent speaker, but I always think it's important when we're particularly when we're talking about indigenous issues that that people hear some words in indigenous language because many canadians you know have been taught that uh, canada is just just has two official languages but there are about 40 or 50 indigenous languages that were being spoken on these lands for thousands of years so so i'll introduce myself i'll introduce myself in, in the language and basically what i'm saying is uh, there's a name I've been given, Benessi, which is a type of bird. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I'll say that um, I come from two family clans, indigenous clans, um, the Michisaugig or uh, Mississauga, which is the territory that George Brown is located on. And in my community, uh, the Mississaugas of Alderville First Nation and near Coburg, Ontario. And and I have, uh, through my grandfather, I have a Wajashk or, or Muskrat clan. Through my great-grandmother, I have a Guaho or Wolf clan in the um, uh, Ganyagahaga or Mohawk uh, heritage. And I'll say that my family roots are in that First Nation at Alderville. And uh, I'm a citizen of that community. Um, I uh, Just for the interest of, of our listeners, I also have Jewish heritage on my birth father's side. His father uh, came from what was then Russia in the early 1900s to, uh, to escape the, the pogroms you know, of the time. And uh, I'm very proud of um, both sides of my heritage. Ani Bojo, Benesi Dishnikas, Wajashk Dodum, Michisagig. Uh, Anishinaabek, Kwaho, Kanyagahaga, Haudenosaunee, Alderville, Donjiba, North Bay, and Diana, Anishinaabek, and Dow. So uh, thanks for everybody who's uh, opted to listen to our session. And thank you, Panta, for uh, for being my host. Of course. Yeah, thank you so much. We are very happy and honored to have you here. I think uh, this topic is very important for all of us to learn about. And I think a lot of us being students, especially international students like me, we are coming from different places and we're pretty new here. And it's very good to be able to learn more about this topic. So I'm hoping that everybody gets to uh, listen to this episode that we are recording today. So yeah, let's start with a little bit of an um, introduction about you. I mean, you told us a bit about like your background and uh, your family and heritage, but can you tell us a bit about your advocacy work and um, what basically you've done? Yes, and and I um I was glad to hear a couple of things in your introductory remarks when you talked about treaties as both historic and contemporary. That's really important that uh, people understand that. Um, there was no expiry date on treaties, even though they were entered into, you know, 200 or more years ago. uh, The the language that was used was that these agreements were were to be in place as long as the sun shines. So, Mm -hmm. um, and that's why, uh, you know, unfortunately many of these agreements end up in the courts and they're, they're still being, you know, uh, tested um, in the courts. And you mentioned about new Canadians and, as of a year ago in July, one of the responses to the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was that, uh, I think it was the last of 94 calls to action, was a suggestion that the citizenship oath for all new Canadians, in addition to pledging allegiance to the Crown, and now it's King Charles III, and to uphold the laws of Canada, it was uh, also 
they added a, an inclusion of the recognition of the um, treaty rights as mentioned in Canada's constitution. So, and nobody should ever apologize for their lack of knowledge. Certainly no people of a certain age should apologize for their lack of knowledge because for most of Canada's history, these topics and many other unfortunate chapters in Canada's history, like residential schools, were not included in our textbooks or in the curriculum. So um, in many cases, I think new Canadians are probably as knowledgeable as many traditional Canadian uh, families, adults are. This generation of students are the first people in, in Canada's history to really learn a more inclusive version of their truth. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, I started in the in the newspaper field many years ago, the daily newspaper field. And, and I was, uh, after I left that field, uh, I really wanted to do something more with my life than, as I used to say, make other people rich in the in the corporate world. And so I I started work for about oh better part of 20 years working first with the Assembly of First Nations and then with the Union of Ontario Indians, which is um, their head office is up here near where I am, near North Bay. And I, I came to understand that again that that most Canadians know virtually nothing about the treaties uh, yeah. that really that really are the basis for this country's foundation. If there weren't those treaties, there there probably wouldn't be a Canada. So uh, that that was that stuck with me, and and I proceeded to develop, you know, different public education approaches, and you know, even helped create some some books that will that are being used in schools. And I contributed to the creation of some Ontario Ministry of Education textbooks. Uh, and do a lot of in-person presentations as well as virtual ones. So uh, it's been kind of an organic, uh, natural growth for me. And uh, and I'm always appreciative when I have an opportunity like this to speak to um, people involved in education and hopefully make them more curious about learning more. Amazing. Yeah. And have you always been very passionate about this topic or was it like there a certain time and like something that you were like, I actually have to start letting people know more about this topic? The, the more I learned, um, the, the, the more passionate I became. And, I, you know, I when I began to realize that Canada literally exists because of the treaty relationship, yeah. you know, it wasn't just some sort of you know, the Europeans didn't come here and they just didn't sit down and negotiate these legal agreements. I mean, um, the more I came to understand the importance of them to Canada, the, the more passionate I became. For example, if it wasn't for a treaty relationship from 1764 at the Treaty of Niagara, the largest treaty in Canada, you know, the, the first major one, all-encompassing one, the um, War of 1812 would have likely had a much different outcome because because of, of their allegiance to the British, 10,000 you know, indigenous warriors were Canada's defense force in the War of 1812. And yeah. uh, that literally saved Canada from absorption into the new United States of America. So the more I learned, the more passionate I became. Of course. Yeah, and I think something that you mentioned that was very interesting is that you said there is no expiry date. And uh, basically, we all people who are living here, whether we're like a citizen or we're just like sitting here for any reason, we're in Canada, uh, we are responsible for this. We need to learn more about it. And I think that's something that uh, I personally actually didn't know that like I knew that um, this is a topic that is very important to learn about and like I've heard certainly that um, there is a land acknowledgement. So people always um, start their ceremonies or whatever event that they have uh, with a land acknowledgement. But I actually didn't know that there is no expiry date for the trees. Uh, so that was very interesting to know. And we're all responsible for that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you for mentioning that. And uh, in your talks, you provide the definition of a treaty as a formally concluded and ratified agreement between states. Uh, what do you find are the most important stories to tell in order to kind of illustrate this meaning? Well, um, as I mentioned in, in my presentation to George Brown uh, students earlier today, the idea that there are many treaties, types of treaties in the world, and Canada is, is a signatory 
to many treaties. They involve, uh, there's a North American free trade agreement. There's, that gives um, preference to when trading with treaty partners. There are international treaties and covenants that, that uh, about uh, the proliferation of nuclear weapons. There are, Canada is, uh, is party to the Paris Accord on climate change. Um, so th there are many types of treaty, uh, but many of them, they're specified for a certain period of time or whatever. But the newcomers who came to these lands, when they, when they wanted to get permission from the people who had been here for thousands of years, you know, to start increasing settlement here and sharing the land. There was never any selling of the land. The, the understanding for the indigenous peoples was we're agreeing to share our land. Um, they talked in language that would have been really easily understood through translators. And they used terms like, we promise these things as long as the sun rises in the east and as long as the rivers flow and as long as the grass grows. They, they promised those in that kind of terminology that they knew would have a real impact on the indigenous peoples. And uh, the other thing that, that differentiates Indian treaties, and I'm going to use that word Indian in the historic sense, from sort of modern types of agreement, is they, there was always a, a, a sacred element to these agreements. There was always ceremony accompanying them. And they they often smoke a pipe with, with a, a tobacco, which is considered by many Indigenous peoples a sacred plant. And when one smokes, shares that pipe with someone at a ceremony in some of our cultures, it's like saying, whatever I'm saying to you, my prayers are going up to the creator and the smoke. And what I'm telling you is is the truth. So help me God. And so there, that was one really different aspect to um, Indian treaties. And, and the, the stories, there's so many stories that, that it's important for connected with the treaties for, for people to understand. When, when newcomers started coming here in big numbers in the 1500s, they were in pretty rough shape. They were refugees from really not very pleasant existences in Europe. They lived like slaves in Europe, many of them. And um, they were welcomed. As long as they came in peace, they were welcomed by indigenous peoples from the East Coast, which is where the, that immigration started. And they showed them how to survive. They showed them what foods they could eat, what medicines worked for them. And so the relationship when it started was quite positive, even though the tribes of indigenous peoples vastly outnumbered them. They were quite good at defending their own lands. If they hadn't have wanted these people here, it wouldn't have been any problem for them to uh, make them skedaddle home. That's what happened with the Vikings uh, about a thousand years ago. They came to the East Coast and they brought their warlike ways and the the indigenous peoples they met uh, didn't want any part of that. And they uh, they gave them a hard time, hard enough that the Vikings turned tail and, and, and went back home. So those are the kind of stories about the start of the relationship that I, I think it's important for Canadians to to learn about when they are delving into this subject of treaties. For sure. Yeah. And I think I have to mention this as well. Uh, I mentioned that uh, Maurice talked about this in his talk today. So there was an actual live presentation today that happened. And I believe the recording of that, of the Zoom call and there were slides and everything, will be posted on George Brown College's uh, YouTube channel soon. So if you're interested, you can definitely go ahead and uh, watch that as well. There's actually one talk from last year as well. So that would be also pretty helpful if you want to look at that. Um, but also, I know, I don't know if our listeners would know, but you also wrote a graphic novel called We Are All Treaty People. Can you explain to us what were the topics that were covered in the uh, story of that book and basically how the images helped the story um, to be told? Yeah, I'm glad to. The um, Again, we I came to realize how little knowledge there was, you know, until quite recently across the country about about the treaty process. And, and uh, so I was working for a, um, a First Nation or political organization that called the, the Union of Ontario Indians. It's still called that. It's, it, they represent about uh, 40 First Nations that are part of the Anishinaabek Nation, including my own, Alderville, uh, and including some, uh, you know, in Southern and, and Western Ontario. And my goal was to produce a book that would be suitable for children of all ages. 
uh, because yeah. no, knowing that, you know, I've met university professors that don't know any more about treaties than than kindergarten children. So that, that was our goal. And so yeah. it consists of about 24, 28 pages. And all of the illustrations were done by uh, an Anishinaabek artist named Charlie Hebert from Dokis First Nation up here. And he actually was a graduate of, I, th I think it was at Sheridan College, had a, an animation program, I think. And he was a graduate of that many years ago. So he's yeah. a very talented artist. So that was the, the, the very visual publication, a graphic novel. And my task as a writer, and it helped that I was a journalist, that I had to produce text on each of these pages that, that summarized very complex topics in plain language. And we were really proud that we did that. And um, actually, that book has become part of uh, kits that are produced that are, I think there have been over 15,000 copies of that, that little book in wow. print. I, th I think it qualifies as a Canadian bestseller. Um, and, um, and those kits include teachers, resources that help them you know, introduce the topic in their classroom. There's a Lego wampum belt that is included in the kit for elementary age students. And we also started production when I still worked there of a secondary school kit. And I um, created another text. I didn't write it all, but we, you know, I, I edited it and coordinated the content of it for older students. And, and, and it's a book called Nation to Nation. And it, it's about the um, uh, the 46 treaties in, in the province of Ontario. And uh, Again, it's ideal for older students and even for adults, and it's university level. It's 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 a handy little little book. So um, I'm very very privileged to have had the opportunity to help produce those resources, which again, like the treaties themselves, they they have got good shelf life. They're they're just as valid now as they were when they were produced. Yeah, I'm sure about that. And uh, th honestly, the, the book sounds very interesting, both of them. Uh, um, I would love to see it. I love graphic novels as well. So I think the visuals also would be very interesting and very helpful to understand uh, the whole concept as well. So like, is there anywhere that people can go and see the book? Is it in like a particular library or is it actually being still published? It's still, still in, in published. It usually is part of those kits. I think, I'm not sure if they still sell the oh. books. I think that you can still get the books independently. I know they're available from mm -hmm. um, um, the Union of Ontario Indians up here near North Bay. And you can check their, their website. And there's, I'm trying to remember the name of the place at Six Nations, um, Good Minds. It's called Good Minds on Six Nations, okay. and uh, they they distribute it as well. The other thing in the elementary kits, in particular, because we know we're dealing with with sometimes very young school children, there are also uh, video recordings. So so there's a video and some voice that are partnered with the uh, We Are All Treaty People booklet. So it's and it's also available in three languages. It's available in English, in French, and in in So um, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, and now that we are talking about educating students, uh, how can individuals, particularly students here at uh, George Brown College, actively support and promote the recognition and implementation of Indigenous treaty rights uh, and agreements? Well, the, the, the most important thing, you know, we talk about truth and reconciliation and that process that, that was the result of a, a four-year, five-year inquiry across Canada that produced those 94 calls to action. And by the way, that wasn't the first one. 20 years earlier, there was a Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples that did much of the same thing. Maybe the timing wasn't right. Maybe the political environment wasn't right. But um, uh, in any event, the, the most important first step in truth and reconciliation, and reconciliation is about creating a, a, a good relationship between Canadians and and indigenous peoples, a better one than has existed for Canada's first century and a half. But the first part of truth and reconciliation is truth, and that's learning. And there are so many sources now, and just about every, I know your campus, I think, has an indigenous office or someone who, who you know, yeah. who has input into the, from which other professors and, and departments can, can benefit. Um, uh, and uh, and there's so much stuff now on the uh, on the internet that didn't exist even a few years ago. There are far more resources than ever 
were. I, I was looking at the internet yesterday to get to get some history about Treaty 13, which is the treaty that covers the area on which George Brown's you know main campus is located. And those are things that just didn't exist, you know, maybe five, six, seven years ago. And, and yeah. you know, there have been good um, people, knowledgeable people produce that that information. And uh, so I encourage anybody who, who wants to learn more about this country uh, to learn about the, the treaty that covers the place where they live or work or go to school as a start. And, uh, you know, there are unfortunate parts of Canada's history that people, I think, need to learn about, for example, the residential school system. But I don't come from a place where I, I want people to feel guilty or, or feel that they're being blamed for those things. That's not my goal. I, I just think every Canadian citizen, as you mentioned, you know, should want to know about this country's past, because we like to think that uh, history repeats itself. And if we don't learn about things that have been problematic in the past, uh, maybe they'll they'll repeat themselves in different ways. So we don't want that. We want to learn from the past and sure. how to make Canada better. And I think Canada is one of the, the best countries in the world. For sure. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. It's uh, very important to learn from the past. And I definitely agree with the statement that you said, like uh, the history repeats itself. So um, yeah, and you were also mentioning the Indigenous office and basically Indigenous support at George Brown. And I was looking at it uh, while we were talking. Um, we do have the Indigenous Initiatives a group here at George Brown College. They have a bunch of employees and they have an uh, Indigenous education strategy that they actually uh, recently published. So if you're interested in learning about the strategy that George Brown is following, you can go ahead to their website, which you can find on our George Brown College website and read about that. And they also have Indigenous mentorship programs and a bunch of social and cultural events that you can participate in if you are interested to learn more about this topic here at George Brown College. So yeah, I just thought I would bring that up and I'm sure we can put that in our show notes as well. So you can just basically find the link and uh, click on it. Another reason that we actually wanted to have this talk with you and something that we wanted to teach their uh, students, I think, was that we want to make sure that they understand that the treaties are still contemporary. It's a topic that is still relevant and everybody has to understand how it connects to our everyday life today. So in your research and exploration of treaties, have you come across any examples of how traditional Indigenous knowledge has been integrated into modern environmental efforts showing the significance of treaties and preserving ecosystems and biodiversity? Mm, yeah, and the treaties uh, have always been about the land uh, yeah. and, and indigenous peoples around the world. And there are, there are uh, about 400 million indigenous peoples around the world. We tend, wow. we tend in Canada and in the United States to think that indigenous peoples are only here. But I have met indigenous peoples from Finland, from Russia, from China. You know, they're indigenous peoples everywhere in the world. They're first peoples. Yeah. And they have always understood indigenous peoples, probably more than, than modern people. They have understood the importance of looking after the earth and the waters because that's how they survive. I mean, they, you had to. You had to, you know, uh, look after your environment, or you, you. They understood you. You wouldn't live. You could, you, you know, they depended on it entirely. And we have evolved into societies that have monetized uh, everything. Um, we've monetized, uh, you know, the gifts that we had that we originally were given for nothing to survive. The the air that we breathe, the water that that sustains our life the land that we live on, the fire that gives us heat and light, all of those basic human gifts from our creator have been monetized. Like the land, of course, has is, is been monetized to the extent that even though housing is regarded by the United Nations as a human right, many young people can't afford to ever hope to own their own home. Land and housing has been priced out of all reality. Um, if you go into a hotel room in downtown Toronto, they'll have a bottle of water on the table that you can buy for five dollars. Um, not only is that water not particularly good, but it's uh, 
uh, we shouldn't be having to pay for, you know, for that. And those companies shouldn't be allowed to sell <laughs> water at great mm-hmm. profits. Um, uh, the air that we breathe, if you're, if, if you have certain kinds of respiratory illnesses, you have to pay to have oxygen to help you breathe. Uh, and now to heat our homes, uh, we spend a lot of money on, on uh, creating that fire. Huge, some of the most profitable companies in Canada are, are resource-based uh, extractors of, uh, of oil and natural gas. So we, we pay for all those things that, that we were given free, you know, when we first came uh, on this planet. So, and most Indigenous people still do their part in trying to observe that respect for nature. And my community, Alderville, they have protected an area for a tall grass prairie. Uh, that's natural to that environment in southern Ontario. And it's like a preserve, and as are all the the associated species that are used to that environment. And there are many examples of that. Most of, of what many people see when they see about uh, Indigenous peoples in the environment are, are them protesting uh, cases where people are trying to build pipelines or things that harm the environment. And because uh, we have clear-cut forests and and done so much damage, you know, to nature, we're starting to see wildfires and and climate change because we have done things counter to the you know the natural order. We're seeing dozens of species disappear um, every week from the planet because uh, you know we haven't created the environment that they need to survive. Um, and indigenous communities, as I say, in my own, uh, you know, in their own little way, are, have projects to, to try to preserve, you know, a natural order. I know in um, there are some places I can't remember which South American country it, it might be Colombia, where the the indigenous populations have got legal representation to have rivers declared to have legally the same rights as human beings. Um, to have human rights. So you can't, you, you, you know, our courts are pretty good at defending humans having human rights. But if we start treating our waterways and our land with the same sort of uh, protection, maybe that's what it's going to take to stop some of the, the degradation of the planet that's, that's causing so many problems. So, yeah, Indigenous peoples are at the, at the forefront of, of environmental issues. Yeah, that was very interesting. I never heard about um, the story that you just mentioned, like rivers having rights. And that's a very interesting way of looking at it. Like we are always like, yeah, we have to protect humans, human rights. Um, But the fact is there are probably much more humans than there are rivers or natural resources. And um, we have to protect them because they're going to be gone soon for good if we don't really protect them and if we continue living the way we are living now unfortunately well it's against a lot it's against a lot of poison a human being why shouldn't it be against a lot of poison a river on which human beings depend for their survival you know absolutely yeah and um yeah in your uh, talks also that i mentioned it's uh, on youtube you uh, actually had these indigenous knowledge keepers series and um so a part of that talk was that you told the story of the 1764 treaty of niagara so the british uh, promised the indigenous people healthcare, education the central lands of the continent and more in exchange for a british settlement on their land uh, indigenous warriors even actually fought against the americans on behalf of the british in the war of 1812 with this promise in mind, as you mentioned in our conversation before. Um, so this makes me think about how treaties are like a form of trusting uh, reciprocity and how by breaking their end of the treaty agreements, the British truly stole all of the land and resources that they occupy today. So as George Brown students, whether we are Canadian citizens or just temporary residents on this land, what are some of the ways that we can respond to these broken promises now? Well, thank you. Um, I'm the, the Treaty of Niagara was the major treaty, as I as I mentioned. It was it was a broad um, recognition of indigenous sovereignty um, and nationhood. And subsequent treaties that were more specific to different areas, they made very specific promises. For example, 
the Treaty 6 in, in what's now Alberta promised that the First Nations would always have a schoolhouse. Well, that's education. And contrary to one of the, the common myths, not all Indigenous kids get free education. Uh, the government of Canada does not keep that promise. They they give a, a token amount to each of the 634 First Nations across the country, usually based on their population. And there are, there are huge waiting lists of young people who don't get to go to university because Canada has not kept that promise. And uh, for example, my community of Alderville, um, we were one of seven communities that, that accepted a settlement for the Williams Treaty that involved a sum of money. And we take a good ch a chunk of that money and created a trust. And one of the things, the projects that our trust funds is that every eligible student from Alderville, wherever they live, whether some of them live in the United States, some of them live you know, in different parts of Canada, as long as they have the qualifications to attend post-secondary education, we now have the funding so that there is no waiting list. Every one of them goes. Now, we shouldn't have to do that because Canada promised that they would yeah. do that. But we think it's so important that we will use the funds that we got as part of that treaty settlement to pay for what Canada has not uh, paid for and, and the promise Canada has not kept in this treaty right now. There are, were also promises that the government of Canada would always provide a medicine chest. Yeah. Well, that's health care. And because they couldn't envisage the type of uh, hospitals or treatment centers that exist today, or in the case of education university, that's that's okay. The courts, the Supreme Court of Canada said that the treaty language must be interpreted in the ways that the Indians understood it at the time. Yeah. So whatever form education or health care take, that's that's a treaty promise. And uh, and what can students do? Well, I asked a question of one of my hosts this morning. I said, how many um, international students are there at Sir George Brown? And, and they estimate it's about 30 or 40 percent, which is extremely high. There are 900,000, I'm told, um, international students in Canada right now from different parts of the world. And um, it's really important that they learn about the treaties, you know, as it's, it's important that they learn about their own country's complete history. And, and I think that one of the things that, that many uh, international students understand is the process of colonialism. Yeah. Because in, you know, in many parts of the world, people have been colonized, their resources have been taken with no treaties. One of the things that sets Indigenous peoples in Canada apart is our ancestors are smart enough to get treaties. So they have the basis to take things to court. They have a, even if a broken promise is better than no promise at all, sure. because you have a legal basis to pursue it. So there are many people from, from countries in the African and Indian subcontinents where they understand what colonialism can do to populations and, and everything from slavery to, you know, resource pillaging. Um, so I think in many cases, international, some international students have greater understanding of the challenges that Indigenous peoples have faced in Canada than even Canada's own domestic populations. Mm -hmm. But what but what can they do? Well, what every citizen can do is A, learn about things like treaties. And if they are citizens, they have a voice and they can make their opinions known to their elected representatives. And usually at election times, that's a good time to, and there's going to be an election in a federal election in Canada within the next year. That's a good time to attend political meetings and ask, what are you doing about the, the treaty rights, you know, in this area where, where your political constituency is? What are you going to do about it? Um, and if, as in the case in many parts of Canada, there has been no settlement of the treaty or, or related land claims, that's a good time to raise it. They can write to their politicians as classes and they say, what? We understand that this is the case in the, in your writing. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about the fact that that there are there might be First Nations in your constituency that don't have access to safe drinking water? What are you going to do about it? Everybody in Canada deserves to have safe drinking water, but we have communities like Niskantiga 
in Northwest Ontario that have been on a boil water advisory for 30 years. Oh. 30 years. That's, that's well, I, Can you imagine wherever you live, not, not feeling that it's safe to drink or to bathe in water from your tap? Uh, those are things that our politicians have to have to be be called to account on. So, and I like to think that part of our education community, they have more intellectual resources than many people to start calling their the elected representatives in our governments to account to do that. For sure. And you can have the kind of sessions like we're having today. That's something that educational institutions do more and better than maybe anybody else is have sessions like this where your student body can can learn about things uh, like this. So that that's a contribution to reconciliation. Exactly. Yeah, I think these sessions can be definitely very helpful. And it's not just these sessions. It's not like certain days that we need to be studying about this topic. As you said, we're all treaty people. This is something that has to be a yeah. part of our everyday life. And um, you also explained the story of how uh, current day Mi'kmaq lobster fishers on the east coast of Canada are having their lobster traps ruined and vandalized by settler Canadian fishers because the Mi'kmaq are fishing outside of the commercial uh, fishing season. Um, you explained how the commercial fishers actually don't understand that the Mi'kmaq have uh, treaty rights to fish during their own season. So um, they're not actually doing anything um, legal. And it seems that the Canadian government actually is not also interested in educating Canadians widely about treaty laws. So why should uh, settler people such as George Brown College students um, strive to learn about these laws themselves? One of the things that puzzles most Canadians is how can we have treaties that say certain, make certain promises? How can these things be protected in the highest law of the land in the Constitution? And how can we still see these instances like in, in the lobster fishery where governments and their policing agencies do nothing to protect that treaty right? Well, what, what people don't understand is that under our parliamentary system of government, you can have high minded principles in your constitution, but they must be implemented by politicians into law. And that's why, for example, in the United States, you can you can hear in the United States Constitution, they say high minded things like uh, all men are created equal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, many of the people who drafted that Constitution owned slaves. Um, and the reason that there were still race riots in the United States, you know, 200 years later after their Constitution was that many of the states did not have legislation that insisted that, for example, black people be allowed to go to the same schools as white people. Um, and the federal government had to step in and impose federal legislation to supersede or make up for the lack of state laws that allowed discrimination to take place. So that's a prime example of how, regardless of what a constitution says, it may sound nice, it, it, it may sound lovely, but uh, but there need to be specific laws passed by politicians uh, to enact treaties. And when a treaty comes into effect, like the Nishka Treaty in British Columbia, that required an act of parliament to bring the land and resource rules into effect. Um, there was a Supreme Court decision that upheld the Mi'kmaq right to fish, as their treaty had said. But there has to be a parliamentary piece of legislation that says this is now the law, a law in this land. And unfortunately, um, because yeah. you would think that our highest law of the land, the Constitution, when it says something, you'd think everybody would have to obey it. But when we talk in, in those principles about nobody will be discriminated against because of race, creed or color, etc., there has to be a code or a law that implements that, that makes it illegal not to follow those principles. And that's what yeah. we're missing in Canada. And that's why our citizens yeah. need to speak out about uh, those things. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's always the governments, the courts, the constitution, all of those. And the decision makers, they really make decisions. But I think we should never forget that 
the people also have a lot of power. So I think the, the change obviously always starts from us people as well. Yeah. So we should also stand up for it. And that's what is really important. And speaking of the future, my last question is, what would you like to see for the future of the tree lens and the so-called Ontario? Well, I'm very optimistic. And some people wonder why Indigenous peoples would have any optimism because of a lot of unfortunate things that have happened in the past. But the older you get, the more you see change happen. And I've seen a lot of changes. Uh, 10 or 15 years ago, I can't imagine a, a college or a university in this province, in this country, having me on here talking about things, you know. Th those are changes yeah. and they they sometimes they're not as they don't happen as fast as as indigenous peoples would like or or minorities would like but they're happening and and you know you can't reverse societal trends that have taken a hundred or two hundred years to build up you you can't change those overnight and and it's a generational thing and as I say it's the young people it's it's students like yourself that are going to help change cultures and attitudes in society. Um, and I'm optimistic about it because I meet uh, a lot of young people in, in the work that I do, and they all want Canada to be the best place it can be. And um, they have a, an understanding of, I hear young public school, elementary school kids talk about things being fair. They understand that. Um, I don't, I don't yeah. remember when I was their age, I don't remember having discussions with schoolmates about, about what's fair in, in the world, but, uh, but I'm, I'm really glad to, to hear and see those things. The other thing, the reason I'm optimistic is despite the challenges that Indigenous people still face, and I was listening to a, a report this morning on CBC that, that said that they have found that They've done huge research that shows that Indigenous women off-reserve, living off-reserve, and most Indigenous peoples in, in Canada do not live on reserves. They live in urban centres, in cities like Toronto. There may be more Indigenous people living in the city of Toronto than any other city in Canada. But um, the importance of these studies shows that Indigenous women living in these urban centres are experiencing racism in their health care. And there have been some awful public situations where, where um, a woman named Joyce Eshaquan was in a Quebec hospital and she was being uh, the victim of racist taunts as she was literally dying. She was being called names in her hospital bed um, because these people have not had proper education or cross-cultural learning. And um, so these are real bread and butter day-to-day -day issues that Indigenous peoples face. Despite these challenges, Indigenous peoples do not, have never said, we don't want any part of Canada, we want to form our own separate country. There are people in different parts of Canada that, that every time they get upset with something that really, is, is, by comparison, is pretty minor, say, we're going to pull out of Canada, we want to have our own country. And Indigenous, you've never heard Indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples support this country because this is their land. So I remain really optimistic about, um, about the change that has started. And as I say, it's a generational change and things will be uh, better, not just for Indigenous peoples, but if the real spirit of truth and reconciliation is honoured and respected, life will be better for everybody in Canada because Canada is not the same country uh, population-wise that it was when it started. You know, we have about 50% of people who live in this country now uh, come from cultures other than uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant cultures. And that's what uh, what is going to make this country a beacon for human rights in the world, is that we will show the world that we have learned to get along with one another, regardless of, of, of having many different languages and cultures and belief systems. And that's the kind of thing that you see on university and college campuses that you might not see in, in some cities and towns in Canada. For sure. And as you said, I'm really hoping that my generations and the generations coming after us definitely will have a better understanding of what is the meaning of fear. And hopefully 
be better advocates and by just like having a better understanding, be able to really create a world that is a better place for all of us. So thank you so much, Morris. That was all of my questions. It was really an honor to have you here. And we, I definitely personally learned a lot from this conversation, and I'm sure that our listeners have learned a lot as well. But um, just to summarize, we have gained, hopefully, a deeper understanding of Marsh's passion that fuels his advocacy and the stories that illuminate the meaning of treaties as more than just historical documents, but as living agreements that shape our present and the future we have explored the power of storytelling through Norse's graphic novel, We Are All Treaty People, and discovered avenues for active support and recognition of Indigenous treaty rights. Thank you for joining us, and until next time, remember, we're all treaty people. See you next week. Thank you, thank you very much.